Hare Krishna. Welcome you all to the Sunday Feast Lecture this weekend on Valentine's Day. This is being hosted by ISKCON New York City. And today we have a very special guest, our GBC, His Holiness Devamrit Swami Maharaj. And Maharaj will be giving a lecture on attachment or detachment, the Priyavrata paradox. So we are just waiting for Maharaj to join. And once Maharaj joins, we'll start the lecture. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. Perhaps I should just wait a couple of minutes for the stragglers to come online, you know? What do you think? Yes, Maharaj, we can have a short kit then, till then. <laughs> Go right ahead. From your side. <laughs> Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Gopi Janabalaba Girid Bharadhari Sura Nandana Braja Jana Rajana Yamuna Chira Panachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jaya Radha Govinda, Radha Govinda Radhe. Jai Radha Govinda, Radha Govinda Radhe. Jai Radha Govinda, 
Radha Govinda Radhe. Go pray, Manande, Hari Hari Bo. Om Gana Chimadandasya, Gananjana Shalakaya, Chakshon Militang Yena, Tazmai Sri Gurave Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhara, Sri Vasari Gor Bhaktavrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. All right. We have a topic today that's actually about mystic yoga. Many of us may not understand or realize that the whole bhakti yoga precept and practice of yukta vairagya, real renunciation, using everything in Krishna's service, is actually, according to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur, a very mystical precept. We might take it for granted. Oh, yes, everything belongs to Krishna. Use it in his service. We take it perhaps as we take it casually. But actually, it is a very deep, profound precept of bhakti. And as most of you know, it is in contradistinction to the Mayavad concoction that the world is false and therefore turn your back on everything. And that would show your shunning, your turning your back on everything shows your renunciation. Now, I find through my contacts throughout the world, when traveling throughout the world was permissible, <laughs> I find that sometimes we devotees take the Yukta Vairagya precept, real renunciation, using everything in Krishna's service, too casually in that we don't understand how profound that principle is and how we have to be careful in applying it. Sometimes it's like when you want to really do something and somehow or other you, you've got to connect it to Krishna no matter how much strain and how much endeavor you just trot out that slogan. Use everything in Krishna's service, Prabhu. <laughs> Reminded me of my early days at the New York Center in the early 70s. Whenever you wanted to justify doing something, whether it was eating another bucket of halava, <laughs> anything, what would you say? Time, place, and circumstance, Prabhu. <laughs> you would use that slogan to justify anything. <laughs> I remember 1973 or 74, Henry Street Temple in Brooklyn. Prabhupada had some indigestion, and so he asked devotees to get him a bottle of 7-Up. And so the devotees did that. But in a split second, the word spread throughout the New York Yatra. Prabhupada's drinking 7-Up! And the devotees just uh, scrambled to the their local stores to get <laughs> whole uh, cartons and crates of 7-Up. It was like seven up is liberated. <laughs> Time, place, and circumstance. Yukta Vairagya, using everything in Krishna's service. <laughs> now, I'm not making any criticism about seven up. What I am pointing out is how we sometimes don't 
understand how expensive or rich or elegant this yukta vairagya, real renunciation precept is. So the Priyavrata history is very important in terms of letting us see the depths of a practical, a most practical situation in the world. You had a world crisis, a crisis so impactful that Lord Brahma himself had to come accompanied by sages like Atreya Rishi, Vashishta, accompanied by the personified Vedas. They all came to sort out this situation. And the devas, the demigods, were watching from their celestial stations. This was a big event. <laughs> Nowadays, when you think of a big event, what foolish affairs come to mind? Oh, the Super Bowl or the presidential election, whatever you think of that. Those are supposed to be the mega events. <laughs> but this situation with Priyavrata was a million times more significant than any little tiny affairs of this little planet Earth. But before we get there, before we get to Priyavrata, which is the first chapter in the fifth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, let's close out the fourth canto. And the end of the fourth canto of Bhagavatam has some themes which will help us to understand this whole mystery of detachment or attachment. It'll help us to understand uh, as we hear about Priyavrata, because the end of the fourth canto has Narada Muni finishing his instructions to the Prachetas. And his instructions resulted in detachment. So you say, okay, well and good. The foremost preceptor, Narada Muni, has given his siksha. He's given instruction. The prachetas are following. They're getting the result. They're detached from material existence. While Shukadeva Goswami is closing out that presentation of Narada Muni speaking to the prachetas, he also brings up the end of the dialogue between Vidura and Maitreya Rishi. And so Vidura expresses his gratitude. He's about to depart from the company of Maitreya Rishi. He expresses his gratitude and he says, look at the result, I'm in ecstasy. In other words, the bhakti process is not just philosophy, theology, some intellectual adjustment, the bhakti process brings results. We are results orientated in terms of our application of the bhakti process. The results we're looking for are detachment from matter and attachment to Krishna. At our outreach centers in New Zealand, I've been speaking on the theme of Bhakti mysticism in terms of it being all about attachment and how we love attachment. Oh, the more attachment we have in our life, the better. We want to feel that we have our hooks in something or someone and something or someone has their hooks in us. Otherwise, we feel, what's the point in living? <laughs> what's the point in going on? My life has meaning and purpose because there's attachment. Now, you cannot get rid of attachment because you're a sentient being. So the question is what to do about the attachment propensity. You'll read in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam where Lord Kapiladev explains to his mother, Devahuti, that 
every covey, every genuinely wise person will agree that attachment to the material is the greatest impediment for human progress. But if you take that same attachment tendency and apply it to the sadhus, then your life can become perfect. So what is it about a genuine sadhu that makes it so attachment will produce such a glorious result? A genuine sadhu or sadhui. It's a feminine term for sadhu. The genuine sadhu or sadhui is all about devotional service. That's how you judge. <laughs> so, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains, maya sakta manapata yogam yunjan marasraya. Arjuna, I'm going to teach you how to be attached. <laughs> Very wonderful subject matter. I'm going to teach you how to be attached. You'll know all about the science of attachment. You'll know it completely. You won't have any doubts. Just listen. Tatranu. I'm going to teach you. So I've been explaining the advantage of authoritative knowledge. We are really suffering because we don't understand. Our life has to be based on knowledge that is credible, and, but more than credible, that is impeccable. So our whole bhakti process is built upon the foundation of Krishna speaking. And we're applying what Krishna says, and we're getting the results according to our application. In other words, we cannot hold Krishna responsible for inattentive or casual or superficial application of the bhakti process. Can't blame Krishna for that. We'll be talking more about blaming Krishna later because Lord Brahma is going to bring that point up about don't be jealous of Krishna because he's giving orders. <laughs> and we don't like being ordered around. <laughs> so Maitreya is closing out his dialogue with Vidura. And Vidura says, what you've told me has produced ecstasy in me. Now, we may not be at that level of bhakti anywhere near what Vidura is going through, but still the process of bhakti brings about results. And you can always check your application of the process and see. You connect the results you're getting to your application. Now, of course, Krishna's mercy is an essential ingredient. We're not mechanistic. Love is not mechanistic. And the sadhana stage of bhakti is about becoming qualified to love Krishna. There's the therapeutic stage, sadhana bhakti, and there's the relishing stage when the rag starts to flow. The acharyas point out that even in the beginning stages of sadhana bhakti, there's a whiff, there's a trace of Krishna praying. And that's why even the sadhana stage has flavor, has juice. <laughs> you know the example about the ripe mango and the unripe mango. There's no difference except time. If, and sometimes that's a big if, if <laughs> the unripe mango stays on in the sun, on the windowsill, it will become ripe. So whether it's ripe or not, you know the example Srila Prabhupada gave. There's no difference really between the unripe mango and the ripe mango. It's just a matter of time. But that time factor can be a big factor. A lot of stuff can happen. 
<laughs> on the way back to Godhead. <laughs> so we're always trying to minimize the impediments and maximize what accelerates our bhakti. So anyway, back to Vidura. He's saying, I, I'm, he's feeling so indebted to Maitreya. He's feeling personal transformation. And he's going to take his leave. And what does he have in mind? He's going to return to Hastinapur to take care of some family affairs. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. We thought that by Vidura hearing from Maitreya, he would be free of all, all those kinds of attachments. <laughs> Remember? How is it that Vidura has been on pilgrimage? He got thrown out of the palace by his own family members. <laughs> they told him, especially Duryodhana told him, get out of here before we beat you up and you're left with nothing but your breath. <laughs> it's a pretty loud hint to hit the road. <laughs> you know how Vidura took the whole incident. This is just the excuse I need to leave home and seek out detachment from matter and attachment to Krishna. He was grateful. There was pain, of course, in hearing such biting words, such painful words, but he sees the time. <laughs> that used to be a popular expression decades ago. <laughs> you old timers may remember the 60s and 70s. Seize the time. <laughs> Seize the political moment. <laughs> well, Vidura seized the time in the best way. <laughs> he got out of there. But now, after traveling to the Tirtas, the holy places of pilgrimage, he's going back to Hastinapur, the seat of family politics. What's going on here? Hasn't he been cleansed of all those ties, of all those attachments? What's going on? Hmm. Shukadeva Goswami explains, he's not going back because of any material attachment. He's going back knowing that almost everyone in the Kuravas is dead from the Battle of Kurukshetra, but he's going to try and rescue Dhritarashtra. So what seems to be material attachment is actually complete detachment. Vidura is seeing an opportunity for purifying a fallen soul and reconnecting that fallen soul, to some degree at least, reconnecting Jitarashtra on the path of integrity and spiritual development. So that's why Vidura at the end, went back to Hastinapur uh, to, to outreach, <laughs> to care for a potential devotee. So then, Pritchett Maharaj, in his dialogue with Shukadeva Goswami, raises the point, all right, we've heard about the Prachetas and Narada Muni's siksha, his instruction to them. But that's the end of the line coming from Maharaj Uttanapad, who is the son of Swayambhuva Manu. That line provided one king after another. You see, underneath the Manu are various kings. And at that time, they were such kings were capable of extraordinary planetary powers. So... Uttanapad, you know, Juva Maharaj's father, shouldn't have been king under the Manu. But what happened? Uttanapad was not the oldest. Priyavrata was the oldest. But Priyavrata opted out at a young age. I said, no king stuff for me. No household life for me. I am going to the forest for meditation and focusing solely 100% on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
So what could Swayambhuva Manu, the father, do? He, he had to press into kingly service another son, and that was Uttanapad. So all this time during the reign of Uttanapad and his children and their children, all that time Priyavrata has been in seclusion. <laughs> solitary meditation on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But now there are no more heirs coming through the Uttanapad line, the Prachetas. That was it. For some reason, no more. And guess what? Swayambhuva Manu wants to retire from universal management. Just like those of us doing the service of GBC, sometimes we always think, oh, <laughs> maybe it's time for me to retire and just chant and read all day. <laughs> Prabhupada would speak like that also. Uh, I just want to give all managemental affairs to my disciples and let me just translate. Uh, it didn't happen for him and Let's see whether it happens to us, his humble, uh, tiny servitors. <laughs> so in any case, instead of Swayambhuva Manu wanting to hold all the authoritative power in an advanced age, like politicians today of all stripes, <laughs> no, Swayambhuva Manu said, it's time for me to get out of this whole political, executive, governmental household scene. I've done my dash. I've legitimately done my dash. It's time for me to leave, but how can I leave when there is no proper king to empower? I can't do it. So this leads to Swayambhuva Manu trying to convince Priyavrata, who's on the Gandamadana hill, secluded, and hearing from Narada Muni. <laughs> this leads Swayamubhamanu to have to go to appeal to Priyavrata. <laughs> and what do you think Priyavrata's response is? <laughs> no way! <laughs> now you would think, well, Priyavrata should be eager to uh, have such kingly opulence, family life, palatial life, wives, children, all in royal comfort. He should be eager. He said, no. <laughs> Priyavrata said, it's true that the order of the father, Swayambhuva Manu, should be followed. But... <laughs> and who was there firing him up <laughs> for the path of Vairagya renunciation? The Indefeatable, Narada Muni. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> You're doing great now in your bhakti yoga practice, focusing on the Supreme Personality of Godhead without any obstacle. The last thing you want to do is take up household life and, and, and kingly powers. So the prelude to this whole situation was Pritchett Maharaj. The prelude to our discussion was Pritchett Maharaj saying to Shukadeva Goswami, I have heard that Priyavrata was completely detached and absorbed in meditation on Krishna. And then he jumps into married life, family life, and kingly responsibility. How is that? Now, of course, we'll say, well, what's the big deal, you know? <laughs> Priyavrata did good. He took the instructions of Narada Muni as far as they could take him. But, you know, uh, the world being what it is and the body being what it is, you know, what's the problem that he kind of, you know, wanted to diversify a bit, you know, and uh, <laughs> have some nice queens have an extraordinary palace, uh, and take responsibility for running the world. <laughs> but Pritchett Maharaj, a king himself, who <laughs> was cursed 
and is now speaking during his seven days left. Pritchett Marge knows. <laughs> How do you give up your life of renunciation and take up the whole kingly household scene? A scene that I was forced to give up because I was cursed by the Brahmana boy. And here, Priyavrata is so nicely situated, detached from everything, in solitary meditation on top of a mountain, guided personally by Narada Muni. Why would someone drop that <laughs> to enter into material complexity? This is Maharaj Pritchett's mm, inquiry. He sees at this point, half of the paradox. How does someone go from wonderful renunciation under the guidance of Narada Muni into being king of the world? Wait a minute, <laughs> it doesn't add up. So again, let me point out, we, with our contemporary mentality, would think, well, it's no big deal. Give, give, you know, give Priyavrata a break. You know, he did good, you know, <laughs> and he'll, he'll, he'll also do good in another way. And, but no, Pritchard Marsh takes this as a monumental event. <laughs> You've got to take into account the potency of Narada Muni's instruction. <laughs> Pritchard Marsh knew that. He said, this Prabhu, Priyavrata has been under the personal guidance of Narada Muni. He's applying everything Narada Muni says. He's getting the result. <laughs> Why did he drop it to become entangled? Whether Priyavrata is entangled or not in his family life and executive affairs, that's another subject. But Pritchett Maharaj is presenting the usual outcome. Why would someone want to risk their spiritual life and jump into that fire. Why? But as we're going to see, there's a bit more to it than, than that. So, Priyavrata has refused his father. And it's a real scene because Swayambhuvamanu <clears throat> wants to retire. And remember, just the fact that Swayambhuva Manu wants to retire is extraordinary. <laughs> you would think that why not cling to power <laughs> until your last breath, like a leader today? <laughs> but no, Swayambhuva Manu understood, as the Bhagavatam says, that I've got to get relief from my desperate situation. I'm entangled. Now, he's a great soul. He's one of the 12 Mahajans, one of the 12 authorities in Bhakti. But still, he's considering, look at my occupation. Look at my external scene. I'm entangled. How will I get out of this unless Priyavrata takes over? <laughs> Just feel his angst. I've got to do something. <laughs> he wants to seize the time. He wants to get out the door <laughs> and head to the forest. But Priyavrata is blocking that as Priyavrata is already in the forest and been there since a young boy and doesn't want to leave. So you've got this friction going on. <laughs> so let's look at Pritchard Maharaj's question. The first verse of the fifth canto. Rajovacha Priyavrata Bhagavata Atma Rama Katamune Grihe Ramata Yan Mula Karma Banda Parabhavaha. King Pritchard inquires from Shukadeva Goswami. Oh great sage, why did King Priyavrata, who was a great self realized devotee of the Lord, remain in household life, which is the root cause of the bondage of karma, fruit of activities? and which defeats the mission of human life. Karma Bandha Parabhava defeats the mission. Sounds severe, doesn't it? You might say, Pritchamars, lighten up, you know? 
<laughs> Give us a break, you know. Uh, <laughs> Most devotees these days are householders or in family affairs. How are they going to be encouraged if Pritchett Maharaj is talking like that? And he's got, you won't say it, but you might think he's got a lot of nerve. He was a householder. <laughs> all right, he had to walk away from it all because he was cursed to die. But nevertheless, <laughs> how can he speak like this? It doesn't encourage anyone. Let's see how the chapter unfolds. <clears throat> you have to understand Pritchett Maharaj's emphasis. Priyavrat is no ordinary soul. Priyavrat is a first-class devotee of the Lord. Pritchett knows that. And Pritchett Maharaj also, out of humility, understands the complexities of family life, the complexities of governmental affairs. So out of humility, he's saying like that. Of course, Pritchett Mars himself is as good as Shukadev Goswami, but he doesn't think that. <laughs> this is the mystery of bhakti. As Chaitanya Charitamrita explains, one paradoxical, very mystical aspect of bhakti is that the more love of Krishna you actually have, the less you think you have. <laughs> now, normally we would think, if I've got something, I really know it, and <laughs> I can measure the quantity. But as we become more and more spiritually advanced, it becomes more difficult to measure the quantity. Because the more you develop in bhakti, the, the more you see the need to develop. And so, Chaitanya Charitam explains, the more you develop in love of Krishna, the less love of Krishna you think you have. And who is the perfect exemplar of that? Of course, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who said to his followers, to his associates, if while I'm chanting, you see tears in my eyes. Let me tell you. I'll tell you directly. It's just a show. Because if I actually loved Krishna, I would have died long ago from separation. But I'm maintaining my life. I'm not dead. So that means no love for Krishna. <laughs> so that's Mahaprabhu's own pronouncement. So we have... Priyavrata, and we're going to hear what happens. Pritchard Maharaj continues to elaborate. Devotees are certainly liberated persons. Therefore, O greatest of the Brahmanas, they cannot possibly be absorbed in family affairs. But wait a minute. Pritchard Maharaj is coming from a family. <laughs> and Priyavrata, one way or another, is going to enter family affairs. So, what's happening? Ah, this is the mystery of bhakti that we're going to find out. Priyavrata was not actually in any material situation, even upon his taking up family life and executive life. He's differently situated. And that is how the whole paradox is going to be resolved. <laughs> so Pritchard Maharaj is provoking you. Think about it. How can this happen? Uh, he's setting the stage. He's, he's setting you up <laughs> so that you'll swallow the pill. And the pill is bhakti is beyond material detachment. So let's continue. <clears throat> We understand that such great souls can't have any material attachment, but it looks like that. And Priyavrata himself is saying, it's going to be like that and I don't want to do it. <laughs> then Pritchard Maharaj points out the other half of the paradox. The first half is how does someone like Priyavrata, 
situated perfectly in transcendence, renunciation under the guidance of Narada Muni. How does he stop that and enter family and executive life? The second half of the paradox is, oh, great Brahmana, this is my great doubt. How is it possible for someone who's king, who's attached to wife, children, and home, to achieve the topmost perfection? So you've got two inconceivable things happening, Pritchett's pointing out. First, that Priyavrata enters kingly in household life. Secondly, that he gives up the family and executive life. So both things are, you might say, using colloquial terms, blowing Pritchett's Maharaj's mind. Wait a minute. You don't go from one position to another and then drop that position and go to another What's going on here? <laughs> he wants us to understand this. <laughs> you know Prahlad Maharaj's famous verse. Matir na krishne paratasvatova mito bipajeta grihavratanam. Those who are grihavrata, dedicated to material life. It's not possible for them to become Krishna conscious. So that's why Pritchard Marge is bringing up the other side of the paradox. It's a dual paradox. How did Priyavrata walk away from his beautiful, opulent family life and executive rule? He walked away from it. So Pritchard's wondering in both ways. <laughs> and he's teaching us what to think about the science of bhakti and its practical application. Mm. Now, Shukadeva Goswami, from his side, he accepts both elements of the paradox. Yeah, it's true that a person advanced in bhakti can embrace material life. That's true. And yes, it's true that a person absorbed in material life can't get out of it, can embrace bhakti. All the boxes are ticked. All those assumptions are correct. <laughs> so that makes the whole situation of Priyavrata, very intriguing because Shukadeva accepts both persons, excuse me, both sides of the paradox. And in this way, we're going to be pushed to understand the nectar of, of absorption in the Supreme Personality Godhead service, which resolves all these commotions, you might say. <laughs> Now let me give you some tips from the Acharyas. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur points out that the Supreme Personality God had wanted to show something via Priyavrata. Just as he wanted to show something via Bharat Maharaj. And you know the history of Bharat Maharaj. He evidently became too attached to a deer and blew his spiritual practices, became negligent and inattentive, and therefore, in his next life, he took birth as a deer, although a deer that could remember everything of how he had missed his opportunity. So, Vishwanath Chakrati Thakur points out that Judd Bart is, excuse me, Later he's Judd Bart, but right now he's Bart Maharaj. He's showing you the faulty application of Yukta Vairagya. Bart Maharaj was thinking, I can accommodate this deer in my bhakti. <laughs> in other words, you might say, Bart Maharaj is thinking, I can use this in Krishna's service. It'll be, all, it'll be a holistic part of my devotional uh, endeavor. So that's a warning to us that we can't take this yukta vairagya principle too casually. We have to think deeply. Yes, use everything in Krishna's service, indeed. But am I capable of doing that without risking my spiritual life? What's my level of spiritual strength? Perhaps by my embarking upon a certain endeavor, 
things will get too complex in my life. Uh, I'll be inattentive in my spiritual practices. And even though I'm saying I'm doing this for Krishna, I'm using this thing in or situation in Krishna's service, I don't have the spiritual stamina to pull it off. So this is why simple living is so important for devotees. So the lesson that Bart Maharaj is teaching is that, so to speak, colloquially speaking, he bit off more than he can chew. Uh, and it's a very dramatic and graphic lesson. Priyavrata is going to teach another lesson. We'll get back to that in a, in a little while. But for now, <clears throat> Priyavrata is going to accept family life after some intervention by Brahma, but he will not lose his station at Krishna's lotus feet. Although his surroundings in terms of executive duties, family affairs, wives, children, seem to be so massive, he never compromised his shelter at Krishna's lotus feet. And that shelter will be described to be like a lotus flower and a bee entering within the lotus flower. So while the bee is within the lotus flower relishing the nectar, the petals of the lotus flower are protecting the bee from hot sunshine and other external elements. So this was actually, Shukade Goswami says, this was actually Priyavrata's situation. He was actually not situated in family life per se. He was not actually situated in his executive position per se. He was situated at the lotus feet of Krishna, just like the bee entering within the lotus flower. And the lotus petals are protecting the bee. This is the mysticism of bhakti yukta vairagya. Now, Sometimes the thought comes up, well, all right, Priyavrata wasn't attached to his household affairs. Does that mean he was a machine, like an emotionless machine? Uh, being focused on Krishna's pleasure doesn't mean you lack the ability to deal with Krishna's parts and parcels. In fact, if you're genuinely focused on Krishna's pleasure, and Krishna's service, you're more expert in dealing with Krishna's parts and parcels. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the measurable result of your having approached a genuine representative of Krishna is yajgatva na punar moham. You won't be in illusion anymore. And what's the symptom of your not being in illusion anymore? You see all living beings as my parts. They're in me. They're mine. So we have this fear that if I'm keeping Krishna in the center of my work life, of my family life, I'll become a robot, I'll become emotionless, can't show affection, can't reciprocate, uh, have to be very tightly wound. No, that's not Priyavrata. He did everything in a consummate way in terms of his family affairs and his duties as king, but he's always thinking. Bhagavatam explains, he's always thinking, how can this be for Krishna's pleasure? How can that be more for Krishna's pleasure? How to keep Krishna in the center? That is not a process of stripping away affection. <laughs> That's not a process of becoming cold and mechanical. It's actually the process for becoming more sensitive, more loving, and more caring. And Priyavrata is going to show that. <laughs> By his always thinking of Krishna's pleasure, he's in the lotus flower. He's not directly situated in any material situation, whether it's family affairs, which he was very attentive to, or executive affairs, which he was also very attentive to. So this is bhakti mysticism. It's very profound and it's very, it's difficult for someone, for an ordinary person to grasp. 
because just like Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, he's fighting. So many warriors are fighting. What's the difference? <laughs> but that Mama Nusma Yudjam Cha, Krishna's instruction, fight and think of me, makes all the difference. You're situated differently. Now, that doesn't mean you can just march off and do whatever you like and say it's all for Krishna. Again, we don't want to take this Yukta Vairagya principle cheaply. We have to see how much our spiritual capacity can handle, how much our spiritual appetite can handle. We don't want to become sidetracked by complexity. We want to be honest with ourselves and honest with our situation. If I do this, if I try for that, if I take on this, if I take on that, I don't know if I can keep my focus on what's best for Krishna. The principle is there, of course. Everything should be used in Krishna's service. But whether we have the spiritual strength to use everything in Krishna's service is another thing. Now, we can increase our spiritual strength by more attentive chanting. I like the way Srila Prabhupada explains the result of attentive chanting. You'll see everything as diverse extensions of the Lord's energy. <laughs> Your vision's going to change. <laughs> you won't see yourself and what's around you in the same way. You'll see everything as diverse extensions of the Lord's energy. And certainly this is what Priyavrata is doing. Okay. So now we're going to hear about Brahma solving the problem. We've already talked about how Prince Priyavrata, but he's been a prince who's been in the forest for a long time. He's not going to welcome his father's order. <clears throat> he's going to, in a polite way, say no. <laughs> and this as we said, produces a crisis. A crisis severe enough that Lord Brahma himself has to come and sort it out. Because Lord Brahma is dedicated to the welfare activities of all living entities. And he's going to show that. He's taking the cosmic administration seriously because that's his portfolio. He doesn't come alone, as we already pointed out. He brings with him great sages, Gatreya, Vashista. He brings with him the personified Vedas. <laughs> we'll find out later, even Lord Shiva <laughs> is there on the scene. <laughs> this is a great event because Priyavrata is a great devotee. And what Priyavrata does is monumental. And because it's so monumental, that's why Pritchard Maharaj is presenting it to you. Pritchard Maharaj is saying to you, look at this. Can you see the bhakti? Can you see the bhakti mysticism? Look at this situation of Priyavrata. He dropped his renunciation and went into household life. And then he made it out of household life and took up renunciation again. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's Pritchard Maharaj's point. So, <clears throat> Lord Brahma knew it's going to be a tough thing. It's going to be a tough thing to convince Priyavrata. I've got to come with my associates. And <laughs> in a sense, we're going to gang up on him. <laughs> You've got the personified Vedas. <laughs> Even Lord Shiva's present somehow, some way. So we're going to convince him. What did Priyavrata and Narada Muni, who are on top of the Gunda Madhana Hill, what did What's the first thing they see? The swan coming. And the swan is surrounded by all these other celestial personalities. So they know, uh-oh, this is a big deal. <laughs> We're seeing the signs. <laughs> so now you have, on top of the hill, three personalities, extraordinary. Priyavrata, Narada and Swayambhuvamanu. Remember, Swayambhuvamanu is trying to convince his son, you've got to do it. And his son is saying no. 
added to that scene is now Lord Brahma. The personified betas are accompanying. They're hovering somewhere and the great sages are watching. So now, Lord Brahma is smiling. Why? <laughs> He's feeling compassion. He's thinking, the Acharyas point out. My dear grandson, I'm smiling because you're stubborn. You don't want to give up your renunciation and enter household life. And I'm smiling because I'm going to force you to do it. <laughs> so we are going to see whose stubbornness prevails. So that's why Brahma is smiling. He feels compassion. Yeah. <laughs> Narada Muni's instructions are correct, but... I'm going to have to outrank Narada Muni. <laughs> I'm going to pull rank on him. <laughs> so, Lord Brahma is going to explain to Priyavrata, the first thing he's going to say is, don't be jealous of the order of the Supreme Personality Got it. In other words, what I'm going to tell you to do is not my own concoction. This is the desire of the Supreme Personality Got it. Don't be jealous. Don't be resistant to it the ultimate authority. Don't be envious. And of course, envy is the reason why we're in the material world. When you, in your spiritual life, start to be able to trace all your anarchas, the unwanted aspects of your material covering, when you start to be able to trace that back to the original problem of envy of Krishna, you've got it right. <laughs> We're envious of Krishna's pastimes. We want our own pastimes. <laughs> we want to be the enjoyers. That streak runs deep in us. So the first thing that Brahma says to Pirvata is, don't be jealous of the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I always wonder because... I remember hearing Srila Prabhupada say, don't be envious of your spiritual master. And I was thinking, well, who would be envious of, of their spiritual master? But it's the order, the, the authoritativeness that sometimes makes us feel that the neck beads are a little too tight around the neck. <laughs> so even when it comes to our dearly beloved Guru Maharaj, uh, there can be tinges of envy. What I got to do that? What I got to do what you say? Uh, <laughs> anyway, there's so many Vaishnavas out there. I'll go, <laughs> so many others I can listen to. <laughs> so Brahma nails Priyavata very quickly. <laughs> don't be envious. Don't be jealous. What I'm telling you is not my concoction. Is directly coming from the Supreme Personality Godhead. Hmm. And then Lord Brahma explains, everyone's got to do what he wants. Just like bulls with a ring in their nose have to be led around according to the ox cart driver. So similarly, we're like that. That's the way it is. So he actually convinces Priyavrata and Narada Muni accepts it because the question came up from Priyavrata that, look, Okay, you're Brahma, you're telling me to marry. And here's Narada Muni, he's telling me not to marry. So, accepting that both of you are spiritual authorities, uh, <laughs> you're giving me an out because you both don't agree. <laughs> so Lord Brahma, in so many words, is going to tell him, don't be too clever here. <laughs> in the wrong way. You can be intelligent, you can be properly clever, by combining my siksha with Narada Muni siksha. And how do you do that? You marry, but at the same time, yukta vairagya, you are situated in always thinking of how to please the Supreme Personality Godhead, and therefore you're actually not in any material situation. Although from the external point of view, it seems that you are. So this is a lesson to us in the power of bhakti, to resolve all contradictions, and resolve all situations. So Priyavrata, of course, is going to accept that instruction. I'll do what both say by 
not being situated in the material world, regardless of my external circumstances. So he agreed, all right, I'll enter family life, I'll, I'll be a proper householder, a proper king, but I'll do it all for the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, therefore it won't be ordinary. He agreed. So Brahma's mission was accomplished and Swayambhuva Manu was so grateful. Now I can walk away from my family and palatial affairs. If my time has come, I was desperate. It looked like there would be no way out. And now I've got my opportunity. Now you might say, wait a minute, Swayambhuva Manu. Just stay at home. <laughs> no, <laughs> Lord Brahma has done his job. I've got my out. <laughs> then later, at the right time, Priyavrata is going to walk away. <laughs> so this is all amazing. Such powerful examples of how more important than the material situation is how we're absorbed in thinking how to please Krishna, how to serve Krishna. That's the defining element. And then you don't want to overload yourself with complexity because that complexity may risk your ability to clearly see what is best for Krishna's pleasure. So this is the kind of challenge of the bhakti life. We're not false renouncers. We want to use everything for Krishna's pleasure, but at the same time, we want the clarity of vision to be able to see what's best for Krishna. And Priyavrata had that clarity of vision. So please remember that beautiful example of the lotus flower and the bee inside of the lotus flower. That was Priyavrata's situation, no matter what he did. He kept himself absorbed in Krishna's service by always thinking, what is the best thing I can do at this moment for pleasing Krishna? The more we take on that mentality, the more we are in actual samadhi. Not artificial samadhi, like in mystic yoga, but real samadhi. The topmost in samadhi is, and what we aspire for, is 24-7 thinking what is best for Krishna's pleasure. And that mentality starts to saturate us. <laughs> I like how Srila Prabhupada describes real samadhi as saturated God consciousness. <laughs> so how do we have saturated God consciousness? By always thinking. Is this the best I can do for Krishna? How is Krishna going to enjoy this? How is Krishna going to enjoy that? And as we do that, our heart opens and we become more affectionate, more caring in a genuine way. So these are some lessons that Priyavrata can teach us. Lord Brahma is going to imply to him that, look, the Lord's mercy may come quickly to someone who lives in the palace and it may come very slowly to someone who goes from forest to forest. In other words, you can't bottle up the Lord's mercy in terms of a particular material situation. Everything depends on your situation in giving the Supreme Personality of Godhead pleasure. This is bhakti mysticism. All right. <laughs> what should I do now? Where's our host? <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna for this wonderful class. Would you like to take some questions at this point? If there are any, how do I take them? Um, I'll um, ask the participants to raise their hands or type in the chat and I'll read it out to you. All right. Is I'm it waiting. Fine? Okay. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand or type it in the chat box, whichever is convenient to you, and I'll read it out to Maharaj. You're seeing who's raising hands? Yeah, till now, no one has raised. No, I see. 
I can see Murli Vadaka Das. You oh. don't see everyone? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Prabhu, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Maharaj, I have two questions. Am I being heard? Yes. Yes, yes. Prabhu. Okay. I have two questions. Um, my first question is, uh, if the order of the Lord was that Priyavrata should take up his, his duties, how come the great advanced devotee Narada didn't know it was the order of the Lord? How come he didn't tell Priyavrata all oh, oh, right away? This is the order of the Lord. My second question is- okay, One at a time, one at a time. Okay. okay. Uh, for the, to answer your first question, I think you'll have to meet Narada Muni and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Narada Muni was not, the Bhagavatam says Narada Muni was not resentful that I've been outranked. Uh, <laughs> he was grateful. And he's doing his part in the whole drama, you know. <laughs> and, and Priyavrata did take his siksha seriously about how to be detached even though he would be in a, in the midst of family and executive affairs he he kept the the, the kernel of narada's instructions although the circumstances apparently changed <laughs> so when lord brahma departed shukadeva goswami describes that narada muni was happy swayamuvamanu was happy and priyavrata was okay <laughs> Okay, you, uh, you had another question. Yes, because this is good because it leads to my second question. If I'm not mistaken, at the end of the story of Priyavrata, Prabhupada very strongly indicates that Priyavrata was actually influenced by the material energy when he was in his position. So even though he was a great devotee, it, and anyway, Prabhupada indicates this. So how are we to understand that? And it would seem to me, that that it's just an argument, don't do such a thing. Because if, if even Priyavrata can be influenced, then what hope do I have? Well, you have to understand what that means, that he's influenced. It, sometimes the waves rock your boat, but they don't capsize you. <laughs> <laughs> you walk outside on a windy day, and yeah, the wind is, is blowing, but it doesn't you know, knock you down. So... And the proof is that Priyavrata walks away from it all at the right time. <laughs> and that's why Pritchett Maharaj is exclaiming, it's a miracle that he got into it, and it's a miracle he walked away from it. <laughs> it's a double-edged paradox. <laughs> Anything else? I see such wonderful Vaishnava faces. Jagannath Pandit, Chintamani. <laughs> well, yes, Sahadev. Yes, Sahadev. yes. Sahadev Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for the class. Um, I have one question about a bee getting into like a rose flower and the petals covering the bee and saving the bee from the scorching sun. So that was a reference to Priyavrata uh, being protected by the mercy of the Lord. But we also see that sometimes a bee tries to enter into a flower to enjoy the nectar and gets its wings bruised by the thorns. And so somebody enters into material life and does not become uh, influenced by the material environment and situations. Whereas others get into this material environment and situations and get brutalized. So what creates the difference between somebody uh, suffering from material engagement and others 
not suffering from material engagement, even though they both have in material engagements. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Two things make the difference. Number one, guidance. Bhakti is about a guidance culture. The more guidance you have, the more opulent your life is. Real wealth in bhakti is guidance. Whether you want to take advantage of that wealth or not, we could be misers. That means plenty of wealthy opportunities, but we don't take advantage. The second thing is that's why we have saintly persons. We have our spiritual master. We have the senior Vaishnavas. If we take shelter of their guidance, we can cross over all obstacles by Krishna's grace. So you basically you're asking, why does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita, if you want to know the truth about bhakti, then you need guidance. Chapter 4, verse 34. That's the answer to your question. Otherwise, yes, things can get tricky. You can so-called over-endeavor. I want to do this, and it'll be spiritual. Just like, just, just like Bart Maharaj thought, I'm going to take care of this deer. It'll be no problem. <laughs> now, another lesson that the Bhagavatam says the Lord wants to teach through Priyavrata is accepting counsel from senior personalities. Vishnu Chakrati Thakur points that out. Priyavrata is demonstrating, okay, I defer to the spiritual master of my spiritual master. I'm taking the senior most counsel and I will combine what Narimuni says and what Brahma says. So that is a strong lesson. Vishnu Chakrati Thakur says that uh, the Supreme Personality of God is imparting through this pressurizing of <laughs> Priyavrata. <laughs> just like a lesson was provided in the incident of Bart Maharaj and his uh, overindulgence with the deer. So we need guidance. There is no need in bhakti for us to reinvent the wheel year after year. I see this again and again. That <laughs> there's, there's nothing new in terms of what the illusory energy does it's 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 a repeat performance <laughs> it's a rerun movie but it seems to come in new versions different versions but it's the same old same thing when i'm talking with my sannyasi god brothers we mentioned a, a hope we had when we were starting to guide devotees, was that we can save them so much trouble. <laughs> you look at an old timer like Bubritas Prabhu. <laughs> he knows so much. He's seen it all, right? <laughs> so uh, so uh, the, the elders, we sometimes were, were talking, oh, if they would just listen to us, we can, we've seen it all, we've done it all. We can save them so much trouble. Uh, <laughs> to a certain degree, everyone's got to fly their own kite and make the same mistakes. Uh, it takes a rare person, a rare individual who can fully base their life 100% on hearing. That means you're at least in the mode of goodness. But because the mode of passion and ignorance predominate to some degree, you've got to try to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but my situation is going to be different. I'll show you. <laughs> so in a, getting back to Sahadev Prabhu's question, uh, you see devotees get swallowed up by material situations. I remember during my young days in Los Angeles with the BBT in the mid-70s until right after Prabhupada's disappearance, uh, I would hear from devotees, presenting plans for mm, doing big things on the material platform. And then by doing those big things, people would be impressed and then they would come and surrender to Krishna. So I remember one particular God brother, he explained to me, you see, you see Devamrita, it is like Krishna sticking his fist 
down into the mouth of the Casey demon. And first you get the fist into the mouth, then you expand the fist. So we're going to go inside the material energy and then expand. Hmm, nice theory, but... So I hope that incident, that anecdote would help you, Sahadev, in your in answering the question. Anyone else? Maharaj, we have one last question. Okay. So this is from Dasya Prem Prabhu. He says, you said it takes certain level of advancement to do Yukta Vairagya. What about not being able to give up attachments fully and only being able to do Yukta Vairagya? Only be able to do what? Yukta Vairagya. Only be able to do Yukta Vairagya. I'm not understanding this question, Dasya Prem. Prabhu, do you want to ask? To Maharaj directly, please. Uh, Hare Krishna. Um, so I've just seen, well, with myself also, uh, think the thoughts that, okay, I need to kind of cater to my material conditioning in order to kind of get some inspiration and enthusiasm in, in my practice and not being able to just kind of fully, uh, you have fully heed to the guidance of the superiors. It's a hard question to answer without knowing what material endeavors for satisfaction you're referring to. <laughs> I could give you the hardline sannyasi answer. No material activity will satisfy you, fulfill you. <laughs> or I could give you the softer, gradualist answer that, well, the main thing is you go on with your bhakti practices and gradually these material attractions will slide away. So you take your pick. <laughs> I've given you an assortment pack. So now you pull out the one you want. <laughs> okay. All right. So I thank you all for your kind attention. It's been great seeing you all. So many shining Vaishnava and Vaishnavi faces. <laughs> thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.